Thank you for coming out on this lovely sunny day that's a little bit cold. And welcome all to the first lecture of the Shemmel Forum's Spring Semester World Affairs briefings. Much like the crocus, we arrive, no matter the weather, as harbingers of spring, with new opportunities to sharpen our wits in this ever more complex, ever more perplexing, ever more connected world. Those among you who were with us for university for a day last October 2nd have already had the good fortune to meet and soak up some of the wisdom of Clement Price, who spoke that day about the role of the professor in the community. It was your enthusiastic response to his talk that prompted us to have Clement back here as soon as possible, so that more of us could benefit from his knowledge and be infected by his commitment to community from the local to the global. Today, Clement will speak about the significance of Black History Month in the modern telling of the American story. Black History Month has had a profound impact, both symbolic and substantive, on our awareness of the significant place Black Americans have in the history of this nation. We've asked Clement to launch this series on world affairs briefings because our engagement in world affairs starts with our own self-knowledge about who we are as a nation. Clement Price is professor of history and founding director of the Institute on Ethnicity, Culture, and the Modern Experience at Rutgers Newark. He is a passionate citizen of Newark, a distinguished alumnus of, of and professor at Rutgers, and is fast becoming a treasured friend of this university. Please join me in welcoming Clement. Thank you. Thank you, dear. Well, thank you, Sandra. If you have not been introduced by Sandra Myers, consider yourself working at a deficit. Uh, she, she crafts the most elegant um, introductions to colleagues and friends, and I'm a beneficiary of that. Thank you, Sandra. And it is indeed good to be back uh, um, here at uh, the University of Scranton. Uh, I was here not too long ago, and I see um, some some familiar faces. I want to uh, send out a, a thank you and uh, to Maury Myers, who, who um, I've known almost as long as Sandra, and uh, you're the provost of the university, Hal Bailey. I don't see Hal. I, he might be en route, or he might be doing what provosts do: solve problems, make bricks without straw, those those kinds of tasks. And uh, Rosette Adera, who is here and who visited me at Rutgers um, last Saturday when Rutgers observed Black History Month. Uh, we've been doing it for over 30 years um, at a public program that now draws just hundreds of people. And in fact, in many ways, what we've managed to do at Rutgers inspires uh, this presentation which is titled, Recentering the American Story, an Ode to Black History Month. What I'd like to do is to suggest that, that Black History Month is quintessentially American. And, and it has helped to cast a bright light on American history. And through the popularization of the month, I mean, Black History Month has become a big deal. It's merchandised. Um, I'm busy as I can be from roughly the King holiday to the end of February, and then I must turn the leaf, and then it's Women's History Month. Uh, in fact, I've said, show me a, a black historian who's not busy during Black History Month, and I'll show you a sorry black historian. Um, and the field also has changed um, demographically. Uh, black History Month and the field of black history used to be pretty much racially so siloed. It was something that Negro historians did, and they did it at Negro schools, and they, they sold books to American Negroes and Negro History Week, which dates back to 1926 was a ritual mainly for black Americans. Those days are gone. Um, my graduate students now, most of whom are white, 
are disproportionately interested in African American history. The PhD program that I graduated from, the, the great program at Rutgers in New Brunswick, um, is now uh, considered one of the finest PhD programs in the country for women's history and African American history. And most of the students in both of those programs are women and they're not black. So uh, stay tuned, our country's history is gonna change because of the uh, movement of more women into the history profession and the movement of more non-blacks into black history. It's gonna be kind of fascinating to see what, um, what that demographic shift will yield. There are a few things that set the stage for an address such as this. Why have black people made such a big fuss over their history? Why a month? Why February? Some of my students, you know, they're so cynical students. They believe that um, Black History Month is in February because it's the shortest month. You know, <laughs> you know black short changed again. And I said, no, no, come on, come on. It, it was established in 1926 by a very distinguished American scholar and African-American, a guy by the name of Carter G. Woodson, Carter Goodwin Woodson, who was the second um, American um, of African ancestry who uh, received a PhD from Harvard, very bright guy. And he established Negro History Week back in 1926. It was the second week um, in, the, in the month of February because the beginning of that week was either Frederick Douglass's or Abraham Lincoln's birthday, and the end of the week was either Frederick Douglass or Abraham Lincoln's birthday. I forget the, the, the order, but that's why it was February. Of course, every February, and I've said this to, to um, um, Sandra, every February I sweat bullets because Black History Month programs, which take months to, to plan, could easily be snowed out. I mean, I called Sandra yesterday morning when it was snowing, and I said, are we still on? Sandra's always, yeah, we're on, you know. <laughs> Come snow or high water, we're on. Uh, and I've quipped over the years that Carter G. Woodson must have been in Puerto Rico when he uh, you know, came up with it. This is February, but we, we, we'll get through it. So, so why, why the week, why the month? Why do black Americans, uh, perhaps um, earlier than other Americans, make such a big fuss over their history? A lot of it has to do with commemoration and the power of commemoration. And in the 1920s, and I'll go through this, in the 1920s, the memory of our nation's history was being assaulted by what we historians call historical amnesia. Many Americans in the early decades of the, 19, of the uh, 20th century um, had conveniently forgot what the Civil War was all about. In fact, some of you know that we're heading into the sesquicentennial of the Civil War. Um, how will the Civil War be remembered in South Carolina, Virginia? There was a, um, uh, a program just a couple of mornings ago on NPR, there was a commemoration of the founding of the Confederacy um, a few weeks ago, a few days ago actually, um, in Montgomery, Alabama, and uh, a lot of people dressed up in Confederate garb and a lot of women dressed up in Southern Belle attire and they walked down the streets of Montgomery. They did not talk about slavery. They didn't acknowledge that the Confederacy was uh, pledged to defend the right to own slaves. I mean, you almost have to say that to um, get to the reason why the Confederacy was founded in the first place. Um, my wife and I have a little place in, in Milanville, Pennsylvania, not too far from here. It's along the Delaware River, lovely part of northeastern Pennsylvania. We've been 
up here for over 20 years and I notice a lot of pickup trucks in, in Pennsylvania carry Confederate um, insignias on the back. Uh, no state, no northern state gave up more of its boys and men's, men to defend the Union than the state of Pennsylvania. Why would the Confederate flag have resonance in Pennsylvania? I can see maybe South Carolina or Mississippi, you know, that whole Southern heritage thing, but Pennsylvania? In fact, two years ago, Pennsylvania was one of the first states to begin thinking about the sesquicentennial of the Civil War for the reason that I just gave you. And in our first meeting in Harrisburg, I wanted to know why are so many, why are so many white guys with pickup trucks have Confederate flags on the back of their pickup trucks? And I was told by one of my colleagues at this planning session is that it is a sign that a guy is a hunter. I said, hmm, who is he hunting? Yeah. Just, you know, so you see, it's to lighten things up so people can pursue uh, with humor. So Negro History Week and Black History Month has a lot to do with the historic need for black Americans and increasingly other Americans to try to get their memory right and through getting their memory right, try to get the nation to be more attentive to our collective memory. It may be too that Black History Month has a lot to do with what might be called the diversity movement in this country. We're, we're very much concerned about diversity. Why? Oh, clearly within another 20 years, the United States is going to be a global village. No group, no race will be in the majority. That's pretty scary. How will a nation that for the longest time imagined itself being a white man's land, be a land of all of God's children, be a polyglot of cultures and colors. How will we navigate as a nation where race cannot matter as much to us as it did to our forebears? So Black History Month emerged uh, again in the 20s and has become enormously popular since the 1960s because it urges us to, to an extent, accept our diversity. It might also be true that Black History Month helps us to become more comfortable with what we historians and academics call revisionist history. Now, in some taverns and bars in the country, that will get you punched in the nose if you try to suggest that the history that we learned, say, in the seventh grade is not so much wrong, but uh, unsatisfactory. When you talk about the American Revolution in the early decades of the 21st century, you have to have a lot more intellectual uh, muscle um, than you did, say, 50 years ago. What was the role of women during the American Revolution? What, were the role of, what was the role of, of, of um, poor people who mostly benefited from the Revolution? What kind of people fought on the loyalist side? That would be the side of the crown. And in my business, a big issue is that why did blacks fight on both sides of the war? Some blacks fought on the patriotic side, some fought on the loyalist side. Could blacks not make up their mind? Well, if you know your American history, at least the new American history, you would know that blacks tended to fight on both sides because it was in many ways a crapshoot. Whatever side won, they believed that um, they would benefit from that. They would gain their freedom. The society would open up for them. So those of you who've traveled to Canada, throughout Canada, especially throughout Eastern Canada, there are little clumps of blacks who um, can trace their uh, settlement there back to the American Revolution because their forebears fought on the loyalist side. The loyalist side lost. Let's cheer the patriotic side. But those people left what would become the United States and move to Canada. 
So the issue here is revisionist history. And in African American history, it could be argued, was one of the first major subfields of American history, which argued back in the day that American history needed to be rethought, re-researched, and rewritten so that if nothing else, blacks would be placed within the historical narrative, where historically they had been, what, invisible. So from the vantage point of the what, now second decade of the 21st century, our history looks very different than the history that my parents and my grandparents studied back in the day. There are more women on the stage of American history. There are more blacks on the stage of American history. More immigrants, more workers, more Irish than ever before. And I'll talk about why the Irish are so significant because the study of the Irish actually leads you to a study of how people, some people, not all people, can become white in American society. Negro history is about as old as the intelligent study of US history. That shocks a lot of people. A lot of us believe that black history emerges around the mid-1960s when black people are becoming more self-conscious when blacks are becoming aware that they have a history here, when they are using history to give themselves group pride. Perish the thought. Negro history begins in the late 19th century, and it begins with a, a guy who was not a professionally trained historian, rather a, a newspaper guy. What a name he had for the founding father of Negro history. His name was George Washington Williams. <laughs> yeah, George Washington Williams is the father of Negro history. And in uh, 1886, uh, George Washington Williams, who was a newspaper guy, fought on the uh, side of the, of the Union Army, um, got dabbled in Reconstruction politics, and uh, in 1886, he wrote a massive two-volume text entitled The Negro Race in America. I think it's still in print. This is what George Washington Williams wrote in the preface of his book. And these are poetic words for sure. And I quote, I have tracked my bleeding countrymen through the widely scattered documents of American history. I have listened to their groans, their clanking chains, and melting prayers, until the woes of a race and the agonies of centuries seem to crowd upon my soul as a bitter reality. Great sentence. Then he follows, and this is a really tough sentence. Many pages of this history have been blistered with my tears. Many pages of this history have been blistered with my tears. And although having lived but a little more than a generation, my mind feels as if it were cycles old." End of quote. So that's 1886. And most of you have probably never heard of George Washington Williams. There's only one biography on Mr. Williams, and that biography was written by the late John Hope Franklin, who died just a few years ago in 2009 at the age of 94, 95. I, get a, I, get a, I had a chance to get to know Dr. Franklin, great American historian, and he claimed that George Washington Williams was one of the most important of American historians because he was the first to suggest that the Negro's history was at the center of the nation's history. The words that I just read from George Washington Williams, uh, again, uh, I said 1886 um, was actually 1884, um, are found in his book, The Negro Race in America. And that book made him the father of Negro history. 
Following George Washington Williams, there are some better known Negro scholars, and I hope many of you have heard of two of them at least, W.E.B. Du Bois, who should need no introduction in a reasonably intelligent group of Americans at this stage. He was probably the brightest of American scholars for the first half of the, t of the last century. Born in Great Barrington, Massachusetts, a free black parentage. In many ways, his parentage was not in like that of um, Barack Obama. He was uh, um, of, of mixed racial ancestry, but the society at that time, because he uh, uh, was part African, declared him to be black, and he acted accordingly. Uh, thank God for that, because if, if George Washington, if, if W.B. Du Bois had claimed to be white, oh my, what a loss that would have been to, to African Americans. He is the first black to receive a PhD from uh, Harvard University, and then goes on and distinguishes himself as a great scholar, a great polemicist, one of the founding fathers of the NAACP, one of the um, architects of the modern civil rights movement, and within the context of American history, one of these dischanted American Negroes who ultimately gives up on American race relations. And as many of you know, he ultimately expatriates and moves to Ghana, moves to Accra um, in West Africa, in Ghana, and that's where he died in 1963 just on the eve of the great march on Washington. The other uh, historian who follows um, in the steps of George Washington Williams is Carter G. Woodson. And Carter G. Woodson is important because more so than George Washington Williams and even more so than Du Bois, Carter G. Woodson has this idea that Negro history should be institutionalized, that it should have a framework, that it should have an organizational base. So what does he do? He starts the Association for the Study of Negro Life and History. What does he do with Rockefeller money? He starts the Journal of Negro History. He starts the, the, the Negro History Bulletin for uh, elementary and secondary school teachers. What's very interesting about Negro history is that Negro history begins early on reaching out to K through 12 teachers and to college-based teachers long before, um, say, the OAH and the AHA and the Southern Historical Society. That is to say that Negro history slash Black history slash African American history was always seen as a popular form of history, never elitist. I mean, if you were to go to an annual meeting of the Association with the Study of African American Life and History, you would see seventh grade teachers sitting next door, sitting next to people like Sandra. You know, this, this kind of intermixing of the K through 12 world with the collegiate world. And those of you who know both worlds, uh, those worlds have been separate for the longest time. Many college professors have virtually nothing to do with the K through 12 world, much to the detriment of that K through 12 world. Okay? It's only recently through the efforts of people like Sandra Myers and others, that the, 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 the bridge or the, the cleavage or the moat <laughs> between the K through 12 world and the collegiate world has been scaled by the kinds of things that Sandra and her colleagues are doing here at the University of Scranton. The first image on the on the screen, and where's Michelle? Is Michelle still here? Michelle just gave me a, t no, you don't, I don't need her. Uh, she just showed me how to do a PowerPoint. This is my first PowerPoint. Um, oh, golly, I managed to close the uh, computer. This may not work. Oh, there we go. Um, this is an image, rather famous image. Um, oh. What am I doing? 
Okay, just so I'll just hit the. Uh... Um, you might be able to pick one. Hold on. Just... There we go. Oh. Let me just put my. Okay. So Thank you. So it'll go away. It just wants to verify. Okay. Legitimate. Thanks. Uh, this is a rather famous image, and if you haven't seen it before, it's okay. It's, it's 19th century. Um, uh, Thomas Nash was the great illustrator for Harper's Magazine, Harper's Weekly, and this is from 1868. Uh, it's a little um, uh, hard to read because of the light, um, but you can see uh, 1868 after the Civil War during the Reconstruction period, and Nash captures three white interests, uh, essentially um, uh, reigning over, literally, their feet on uh, this black guy who's dressed up in a Union, uh, uh, union um, Army uniform. He's clutching the American flag. And just to show you, uh, to the far left is supposedly an Irishman and check out the caricature of the Irishman. He looks um, um, almost um, um, animal-like, very unsavory features, which was characteristic of the depiction of the Irish in the 19th century. Those of you who are Irish, I urge you to study your history and your heritage because one of the big issues in the 19th century was how the Irish would become acceptable to Protestant whites. In fact, one of my favorite books is a book by Noel Ignatieff entitled, How the Irish Became White. So you have this on the left, you have this Irish guy in the middle, a, a confederate with a dagger, and on the right, that represents northern capital, and they are reigning over this poor black uh, guy, um, and it, it depicts the, the um, unity of white interest over, um, over blacks after the Civil War. I put this up because this suggests um, how the early generation of the, the early Negro historians this is, this is the America that they were seeking to shed light on. Why didn't freedom matter substantively for blacks? Why did whites um, galvanize their political and economic and numerical power to keep the blacks back? And those of you who, everyone here is old enough, just about everyone, maybe not Michelle, but most, uh, most others are old enough to remember when King um, gives his uh, 1963 uh, March on Washington speech, he starts it off as a history lesson. 100 years later, the Negro is still not free, and we've come before, you know, Abraham Lincoln to set that straight. Um, so Negro history begins in an effort to get our memories uh, more in line with history, and also to suggest that this poor guy at the bottom of the society um, deserved to be treated more fairly. Okay. Scholars then are very much indebted to George Washington Williams, to W.E.B. Du Bois, and I think especially to Woodson, uh, and I say especially to Woodson, because Woodson in 1926 establishes Negro History Week. I assure you it was not enormously popular beyond the Negro community. It was not celebrated, schools were not shut down. I don't think I would have been invited to an audience like this back in 1926. It was very humble, it was racially siloed, it was for Negro Americans only. Um, and when one looks at Negro History Week, it strikes us as a, as a conceit. Blacks drawing attention to themselves. Blacks creating 
heroes and heroines, blacks celebrating their history. In fact, Carter G. Woodson claimed that Negro history was about uh, shedding light on the contributions that blacks had made to American and world civilization. And even now when you run into an African American of a certain age, usually over 70, if they know any African American history, they tend to know what we call the contributionist narrative. Who was the first black um, American to hold a patent? Who wrote the first novel? What black person won the first Academy Award? It's, it's history through firsts and history through the lens of the achievements of heroes and heroines. That was the kind of history that uh, my parents knew um, back in the day when I was a kid. History through Jet Magazine. History through Ebony Magazine, history through calendars and fans suggesting that blacks were something more than they seemed to be in the larger society. Okay. So travel back with me in time to the 1920s when Negro History Week was created. Uh, the 1920s was an exciting period but it was a period marked by very poor memory and I would say by our standards, not very credible history. As I said before, during the 20s, many Americans had forgotten why the Civil War was fought. Many Americans thought it was an unfortunate war, a fatricidal war, a war between white brothers, in fact, one of my favorite books, which I believe I mentioned the last time I was here, is a book by David Blight, great historian at Yale University. He has a book entitled Race and Reunion, uh, and it's essentially about, well, it's Race and Reunion, and the subtitle is Memory and the American Civil War. Um, very important book about how in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, we Americans chose to bind up our wounds by forgetting what the war was all about. And when you look at it, it makes some sense. Terrible war the Civil War was. More American boys and men killed in the Civil War than in World War II. If you've seen photographs of Richmond or Natchez, or as I say to my undergraduate students in my African American history class, imagine yourself to be a Southern white and your world is not only destroyed by the war, but your mythology is destroyed by the war. It was a war like none other up to that time. And it may be that in an effort to, as Lincoln put it, bind up the nation's wo wound, uh, wounds and to get back to making America a great society, maybe amnesia was the best way to do that. It does make some sense that the nation would say, well, the war was not about slavery. The war was about states' rights. There were no tyrants in the Civil War. There were southern boys and northern boys fighting, fighting for what they believed in. And then you have Lincoln. I mean, Lincoln is, I mean, look at how we revere Lincoln. Lincoln was not revered until he was martyred. And when he was martyred, he was claimed by both sections to be the great conciliator. Father Abraham. But when you get into the 20th century, amnesia gets you in trouble. Because if you forget what the Civil War is all about, then you forget the centrality of slavery in most of our nation's history. Not just the 18th and 19th century, but one could argue that slave-like conditions 
survive the Civil War? The scholarship is pretty clear that after slavery ended, another very exploitive labor, social, political system was put in place. So in the 1920s, Negro historians, um, and they're mostly black guys, they are trying to get the nation to take more seriously the history and reconcile what was known with what needed to be remembered. Those of you who are former history majors, you will remember how important uh, history, I mean, what is it, what's the importance of history? History has a certain degree of authenticity. The footnote, the source. So if Negro historians could prove that slavery was a tough institution, if they could prove that Negro men fought and died to save the Union, if they could prove that the 54th and 55th Massachusetts fought with valor, then they could make their claims to American citizenship. Recon reconciling history and memory was very, very important in the 1920s when Negro History Week was established. Okay. This is an example of what Negro history was about. Some of you who are former art history majors, you probably know this painting by Winslow Homer. Um, 1865-1866. It's at the Newark Museum. Uh, and Sandra has, you know, Sandra always has plans of bringing a, a, a busload of people to the Newark Museum. Some consider this to be one of Winslow Homer's uh, most important works because of what it depicts. I mean, who is at the center of this painting? A black woman stepping out of uh, a slave cabin with an African headdress on her head. And in the background are Confederate troops being marched off to some prison camp. Now, um, the, the, the painting has two titles, actually, near Andersonville. And the other title, the one which I like, is At the Cabin Door. That title suggests that this woman, stepping out of her very humble abode into the sunlight of freedom, with an African artifact on her head, she is at the center of the story of the war. What she wants, what she aspires to be, what she dreams in the middle of the night is truly, truly important. And those of you who know Winslow Homer great American artists and made all the greater because in many of his paintings when he depicts blacks, he depicts blacks, first of all, as human beings. She, she's not caricatured. She doesn't look like a pre-human or sub-human character. I'm sorry the photograph is washed out by this brilliant sun we're blessed with today. So Negro history attempted to, or has attempted to suggest that at the center of the American story, it's not so much black people, that would trivialize it, but at the center of the American story is this struggle over what is America? Is America a land of freedom and opportunity and justice? Is, a, is America a society where people have an opportunity to lift themselves up as Lincoln um, envisioned it? Or is it not? That's what makes Negro history so important. Now there were two fields 
of American history that the early historians were mostly interested in. Slavery, Reconstruction, and the third one would be what black people did with their freedom. Let me just briefly look at slavery. Before Negro history, if you were to read a book about slavery in the South, you would probably come away with the, uh, the, the, the conclusion that slavery was not all that bad. That, that, that the Africans were um, primitive people, uncivilized, and that slavery, despite its inconvenience to their bodies, introduced them to Christianity and made them a more malleable people and helped to civilize them. Slavery was seen as paternalistic, not cruel, not demeaning. Negro historians question that. It's not so much that they claim that slavery was cruel, although it could be. They claim that the Africans were undeserving of enslavement. That slavery set them back. That slavery grew out of the kidnapping of West African men, women, and children. That the Middle Passage was a obnoxious enterprise. That view of slavery was generally not the most popular view or the view that was articulated by white historians until the mid-1950s. And a white historian, Sir Sandra, and I know Maury would know, a, a guy who died just what, last year, um, a guy by the name of Kenneth Stamp, wrote a book entitled The Peculiar Institution. And he essentially argued that Africans were members of the human species, that they came from cultures in which religion and cuisine and family life and language and memory all mattered. And that slavery at the end of the day involved a relationship between people who had power and those who did not. And the people who had power tended to be white and those who did not tended to be the black enslaved. Now this, th th this was um, more than a notion. We Americans are only now beginning to um, engage that part of our history. For some, it's a difficult engagement. For my students, my students are fascinated that the slaves held up so well. That the slaves did not um, disappear from the face of the earth. That when they got their freedom, they did not run amok. That when given an opportunity to lift themselves up, they tried to. It's a beautiful story when you look at it. And as I've said, uh, and Sandra knows this to be true, um, in 2015, uh, on the mall of the nation's capital, an African-American museum will go up. Sandra and I know the guy who's the inaugural director, happens to be from New Jersey, uh, Lonnie Bunch. And that museum is going to help us understand what our grandparents um, either could not or would not. How slavery helped to shape our civilization. Okay? So that's, it's important to keep in mind that early on, Negro historians are trying to write or are writing about slavery. The other um, period that they write about is Reconstruction. Why? Because Reconstruction is a period between roughly 1863 and 1877 when the South is reconstructed in a way that brings, really brings to an end the enslavement of, of black people. Reconstruction is a period in which blacks are granted uh, citizenship rights. 
Reconstruction is a period in which black men uh, have their voting rights protected. And those of you who haven't taken a course in U.S. history, now's the time to go back and reread the Constitution. Thirteenth Amendment, Fourteenth Amendment, Fifteenth Amendment. Those are the three amendments on which a modern uh, American civilization is created. That's the, those are the amendments that protect blacks, women, those on the margins of the society. Those are the amendments, especially the 14th, that defines American citizenship in a way that most of us would find credible. And by the way, there are some people out there who are saying that we need to repeal the 14th Amendment. Oh boy, is that scary. A lot of it has to do with the, the debate over immigration. I won't get involved in that debate. It's Black History Month. <laughs> So black historians made a big deal about the emancipation. And this is a photograph taken uh, in Virginia of um, Emancipation Day uh, in the 1880s. This is a, I don't think you can see it as well as I can, a group of blacks outside a store. And you can see over the doorway, maybe you can't see, that's an image of um, Abraham Lincoln. As it turns out, Negro Americans were the first Americans to really embrace Lincoln. It's almost as if blacks adopted Lincoln and turned Lincoln into their patron saint, Father Abraham. I'll talk a bit more about that. Another powerful image which, which suggests what Negro historians were up to. This is a um, uh, painting also at the Newark Museum. It was uh, done in 1904 by Robert um, Henry, who was a ash can uh, painter. Um, the ash can painters were American painters who tended to paint humble people blacks, American Indians, workers, and their painting, their paintings, as you can see in this one by uh, Henry, um, Henry actually, um, this is called Willie G, and it can't make it out because of the light, but you can see um, he's ennobled. He has an apple in his hand, which signifies um, um, you know, humble roots, and some art historians say this, the, the apple symbolizes American democracy, something available to us all. This is a very significant woman here, a picture thereof. This is Marion Thompson Wright. Um, she was from East Orange, New Jersey, and grew up in Newark, New Jersey, and is Sandra and Maury know every February we honor her with a Black History Month lecture series named in her honor, the Marion Thompson Wright Lecture Series. Uh, she was the first professionally trained woman historian, obviously a Negro woman, not necessarily obviously, very, very uh, bright. She graduated from a predominantly white school in Newark, New Jersey, Barringer High School in the early 20s. The first, um, uh, uh, well, she, she was at the top of her class when she graduated from Barringer. Then she goes to Howard University and receives her PhD from Columbia University in 1938. And then returns to Howard where she teaches uh, up until the early 1960s. She's in the second generation of Negro historians. Unlike the first generation of Negro historians, the second generation is concerned about how race and racism work in American society. So, um, so Marion Thompson Wright is very much interested in how education in New Jersey 
was affected by race and racism. Her dissertation was a study of Negro education in New Jersey from the colonial period through the 1930s. And she essentially argued that New Jersey, when it came to education, behaved very much like a southern state. The schools were segregated. Black schools were underfunded. Black teachers could not get jobs in predominantly white schools. And toward the end of her dissertation, she begins to show that the schools in New Jersey could indeed be desegregated and black and, white teach, black and white students would benefit from sitting amongst one another in the classroom. Her dissertation actually figured into the Brown versus Board of Education decision because New Jersey did desegregate its schools over the course of the 20th century, and especially after the state constitution of 1947 um, outlawed all forms of racial segregation in New Jersey public life. And, and the schools were desegregated south of Trenton, New Jersey, without race riots, without black kids and white kids doing battle in the, in the schoolyard. Maybe there were some battles, but the schools um, were desegregated. And the reason why I put this image up is that that second generation included a far better known historian, a guy by the name of uh, John Hope Franklin, who most of you would remember, because John Hope, John Hope, much more so than um, Marion Thompson Wright and people like R.R. Um, uh, Wright and other, I mean, there's a long list of these, mostly men, um, what distinguishes Marion, and she was one of the few women. Um, John Hope distinguishes himself because in 1947, John Hope publishes a book, which I believe is now in his seventh printing, entitled uh, From Slavery to Freedom, The Negro in America. And now it's titled From Slavery to Freedom, The African American in America. That book became enormously popular. And that book made its way to college curricular. I mean, I've used it over the years. It's perhaps one of the most famous books in American historical scholarship. And what John Hope essentially argues is that to understand America, at least to understand America better, it's important to look at the African American experience because it's that experience where the nation's ideals, the nation's aspirations, the nation's commitment to a, its own constitution, its own revolution, its own civil war is tested. Other groups tested, the Irish tested, Jews tested, Mexicans tested, but the group that seemingly tested most consistently and with greatest difficulty has been African Americans. This is another thing that Negro history has reminded us of again and again. The creation of icons. No greater icon when I was growing up in the Price family than Marian Anderson. Philadelphia born, great American singer, barred from singing at Constitution Hall, you know the story, in Washington DC in the late 30s by the Daughters of American Republic because she was a Negro. And the, then the story really gets interesting. Harold Ickes, Secretary of Interior, a progressive member of FDR's cabinet says, let's bring the concert to the steps of the Lincoln Monument. Some recent scholarship to show you how Negro history and African American history and American history work. Most scholars now claim that this is the beginning of the Civil Rights Movement. We normally think of Rosa Parks and the Montgomery bus boycott. 
This might suggest an earlier origin. Why? This image, this concert, most people of a certain age knew of it, knew of the dignity of Marian Anderson. She sang mostly European classics, but toward the end of her program, what did she do? Four Negro spirituals. Also, this is a very interesting, she appropriates Lincoln. This is, you know, this is what, how many years before the 1963 march? You do the math, from 1939 to 1963, that's a lot of territory. But already Lincoln is being deployed by Negro Americans to suggest certain things about the nation about its challenged memory, about the martyred president. And of course, the photograph, which you can get on the web, I have it in my office and I pass it around to my students and my students are so young, who is this woman? And you have to just take them through Marian Anderson. Black artists have also been um, in a way in cahoots with African American history because they too have exceptionalized the black experience. One of the most significant things to happen in the 20th century, and Maury and Sandra know this all too well, and many of you know it, was the so-called Great Migration. Between 1915 and 1965, more than 10 million black Americans made their way from the South to the North, to the Midwest, to the Far West, to Chicago, to Detroit, to Trenton, to Patterson, to Newark. My parents were caught up in it. My dad's from Georgia, my mom's from South Carolina. They met at a party in Washington and the Price family begins soon thereafter. It wasn't until very late in life that I began to see that my parents were actually a part of this great epoch where black people, not unlike the Italians, not unlike the Greeks, the Poles, the East European Jews, are moving to improve their condition. But unlike the Italians, the Greeks, the Poles, and the Jews, there is no Statue of Liberty. There is no Ellis Island. Indeed, there is no monument to this great demographic shift which nationalized America's racial dilemma. We used to think of the Negro problem as a Southern problem. Nobody in their right mind would draw that conclusion now. Okay? So this is a painting, um, 1974 painting by a wonderful um, artist, American artist um, Jacob Lawrence, and this is from his Migrant series. Another iconic image, Rosa Parks. Wish I could find out what the sheriff's deputy is up to these days. Can you imagine fingerprinting Rosa Parks? and having to explain yourself for the rest of your life. So this is 1955. You know the history. Rosa Parks becomes, in the minds of some, the, the mother of the movement. Um, I'll dispel with sense, such sentimentality. Rosa Parks was a trained civil rights activist. Rosa Parks had a earlier encounter with the bus driver who called the cops in to arrest her. A recently published book by a woman who got her PhD from Rutgers claims that 10 years before this picture, Rosa Parks was in, in, uh, investigating a gang rape of a black woman in Alabama by a mob of white men. So this notion that Rosa Parks kind of wanders onto the stage of history 
with those tired feet of hers is just sheer nonsense. So this photograph, which reminds um, some of us of the beginning, the real beginning of the movement, and soon thereafter the surfacing of, my, of Dr. King. And I know I'm running out of time. And let me go through these images. Elizabeth Eckford, 1957. This is a, one of the kids who was called upon to desegregate Central High School in Little Rock, Arkansas. Look at what she is up against. This um, is another iconic image, 1960, Ruby Bridges. In fact, one of the things that uh, Negro historians do, and it, it helps to shape our imagination, they, they claim that black children were children. That black children are not someone born and all of a sudden they become adults. And I think most of you will remember the, the killing of Emmett Till. I always remind my students, why was Emmett Till's battered body so important? It was because he was a kid. And even colored kids are supposed to be protected by their youth, by their fragility, by their innocence. So this photograph, which inspired um, um, a, a well-known um, illustration by the great American um, painter, whose name I'm now forgetting, Norman Rockwell, um, should be known to you. Washington Freedom Riders. And of course, th th this isn't so much a famous picture, but one of the things that Negro history does is that it surfaces um, heroes and heroines. I said that before. By the 1950s and 60s, America is really ready for heroes and heroines. It doesn't have to be Dr. King or Fred Shuttlesworth or Ralph Abernathy, although they make my list. But by the 1950s and 1960s, many white Americans are listening to Nat King Cole, Duke Ellington, Miles Davis, going to see Jackie Robinson or Larry Doby play. Okay? So one of the things that Negro history does, it, it demyth, demystifies the, the black presence in America. So by the time the king surfaces, the country is in many ways spiritually ready to accept a black man suggesting that something is wrong with American society. I remember years ago, Martin Luther King was on the Johnny Carson show. And you know, remember Johnny Carson? Johnny Carson would bring people onto his show, sit him on the couch, and, and they, would, they would shoot the breeze and crack jokes. And, and Dr. King, in many ways, did the same thing. Easy conversation with Johnny. Um, it took a lot, a lot of historical territory for Johnny Carson to invite someone like Martin Luther King. In fact, I tell my students the significance of Martin Luther King is that Martin Luther King emerges during the golden age of television. And the juxtaposition of this technology with black people saying, we're ready to move, we're ready to challenge the society was fortuitous for America. I mean, Dr. King was captured on the six o'clock news. We heard him. We were taken away by his eloquence. We were inspired by his bravery. We were saddened by his death. Another iconic image, King in deep repose either before or after the writing 
um, his crafting of the letter from a Birmingham jail. Now what we're beginning to f uh, realize, again, black scholarship um, has sh shown us that, that black people over the course of the 20th century became v admirable performers. Dr. King always knew where the camera was. In most of the photographs of Dr. King, he's appropriately dressed either to meet with a prince or a sharecropper, always seemingly knowing where he was, which would suggest that he was aware of the technology. Now, as it turns out, some of the more recent scholarships suggest that Frederick Douglass knew of the power of the camera. And Sojourner Truth knew of the power of the camera. So Negro history enables us to imagine blacks uh, having some intuition about how to advance their cause through technology. Famous image. Another famous image and a much more complicated character in Malcolm X. Famous image before King's assassination at the Lorraine Motel, now a museum to the civil rights movement. And I've said this before, in fact, um, Maury and Sandra were at a conference we had at Rutgers um, the room where Dr. King stayed at the M Lorraine Motel, which is now a part of a museum, has been kept as Dr. King left it. And it's become, to some extent, a place where a lot of Americans, blacks and whites, people who participated in the movement, people who were beneficiaries of the, beneficiaries of the movement, go and just stand outside of the vacated room of Dr. King. I had a similar experience three years ago when I went to um, South Africa. And I went to Robbins Island and just stood um, at the entrance of Nelson Mandela's cell. So one of the things that Negro history has done, at least in this country and beyond, is to commemorate places because blacks did not have the wherewithal, the power to engage themselves in commemoration until the 20th century. Famous image by Gordon Parks. And the last image, this was taken of Barack Obama I've been trying to find out where he is. He's obviously on the campaign trail. This is before he's elected president. And he's obviously at some convention of black people and they surround him and the laying on of hands, which is a tradition in many societies, including African-American society. So to bring this to closure, let me say, a few concluding words. The transformation of black history and black men and women and children into heroes and heroines underscores the transformative power of Black History Month. Through its popularity, we are beginning to relearn our history through a particularized lens. It may also suggest that one of the ways that we Americans deal with race is through the creation of heroes. Whether those heroes are black or women, whether they are of immigrant stock, whether they are of humble or prestigious stock, we Americans oftentimes use heroes to help us navigate through the choppy waters of racial prejudice. It is clear that African American history has become one of the core narratives of American history. According to my friend Jim Horton, 
African American history is American history. And let me um, conclude with one of my beginning statements. I think this is the golden era of African American history. There's civil rights monuments and institutions and museums throughout the South. A few years ago in Atlantic City, New Jersey, I worked on a project, the Civil Rights Garden. Why in Atlantic City? You almost have to go gambling to see it. But it's in Atlantic City because in, was it 1964, the, the great struggle over the soul of the Democratic Party uh, was waged right there in Atlantic City. All three presidential plantations, Mount Vernon, Monticello, and the Hermitage. The Hermitage is the lesser known of the three. That was Andrew Jackson's um, plantation. All of those plantations now interpret the larger story of life on those plantations. On any given day, we now know, and now we can admit, on any given day at Monticello, most of the people that Thomas Jefferson saw were black. And the same was true for Jackson. And the same was true for Washington. Once you accept that kind of almost odd reality, then we realize how much our history um, needs to be relearned. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have time? Sure. I'll give you 10 seconds. Yes. Thank you. Showing us how important it is for all Americans, not just black Americans, and how important history is to be really the image over and over again. Mm -hmm. I think how, what, how does the black experience, since they were not immigrants, help us through these perilous times right now that we're living through with the immigrants? Mm, great and question. That's a ridiculously large question to ask. No, no. You know. I always tell my students there's no, there's no bad question, there's no question too big. Um, I think Sandra and Maury might know this. I, I my sister, I'm the chairman of the Save Ellis Island Foundation. I don't think my forebears came through Ellis Island. It's a nice try, right? Um, but the reason why I'm, I'm the chairman, Governor Christy Todd Whitman knows me, I know her, and she wanted a historian on that group, she stuck me on it, and now I'm chairman. Um, although I don't have a familial relationship with Ellis Island, I'm convinced that one of the reasons why Ellis Island was in retrospect, and by the standards of the day, a pretty humane place to land in America, was because the previous landings were so brutal. I mean, look at the way the Irish were treated when they came here. Look at the way the African forced immigrants were treated on their way here. So I think that immigration is that core narrative in American history where we can, and it's, a, it's not unlike African American history or Negro history or black history. It enables us to say, Okay, how does immigration reveal the tensions of the moment? And historically, whenever immigrants come in, whether they're African or Irish or Russian Jews or Ecuadorians or Chinese and Japanese, there is a pushback. I mean, we Americans historically have both sentimentalized um, the newcomer and been wary of the newcomer. If we were to know 
that immigration threatens our sense of ourselves, perhaps we would have um, uh, a little bit more ingenuity in navigating through this moment. Now, the, the current immigration debate, I think, is a lot tougher because for the first time, it looks like we're heading into a society that will not be predominantly white. That's tough. Um, to make you feel a little bit better about the toughness of it, in the late 19th and early 20th century, there was fear that the country would not be predominantly white Protestant. Okay? I mean, you had Teddy Roosevelt literally running around the country in the early 20th century urging Protestant fa white families to have more kids. I mean, he feared, he feared that the Catholics and the Jews and all these people beyond the Protestant Christian pale would threaten the homogeneity of the nation, as indeed they do. So our society, our civilization, is constantly being reinvented through immigration. And we need to decide whether that's still a desirable thing or not. And if we say it's not a desirable thing, then I think we'll have to pull down the Statue of Liberty, shutter Ellis Island, and erase those great lines from uh, Emma, was it Emma, who? Lazarus. Emma Lazarus. I mean, I, I, the moment has come again. What kind of nation do we envision ourselves to be? I always thought um, that we envision ourselves as a nation that would be renewed through immigration, not threatened by immigration. Some years ago, well actually just last year, Frank Rich had a piece in the, in the New York Times, you know he has his annual, um, not annual, his weekly column in the Sunday, and he argued that the debate over the health care bill was actually a debate over the future of the republic because of the things that I just said. Because we envision our demography, our, uh, yeah, our, our demography is changing beyond our capacity to cope with it. And there may be something to that. You know, maybe, may, maybe, I mean, what we're living through is the unforeseen consequences of the 1965 Immigration Reform Act, which opened, reopened the gates of the country to all those who could get in legally. And um, we're in the eye of the storm. Great question, thank you. Yes, Maury. should have, black Americans historically are at once um, opportunistic and commemorative and practical. 
in an attempt to establish an identity that may have been wrested away from them. In the 18th century, many black Americans referred to themselves as African or as Ethiopian. In the early 19th century, when some whites had the bright idea of returning blacks to Africa, blacks dropped African and began calling themselves colored Americans or oppressed Americans, which segued into Negro Americans and later Afro-Americans. And in the 20th century, uh, in an attempt to identify with, if you will, Mother Africa, the term African-American was used. It, the, the, the nomenclature and the, and, the, and the conflict over nomenclature reveals how complicated it is to be black uh, in, in historical terms. Um, interestingly enough, when I went to West Africa for the first time, uh, and I went to Ghana, I, I didn't feel the connection with the Ghanaians until I went to one of the slave forts, Elmira um, especially, and going through the slave fort, there were commemorative shrines in the fort by black Americans from places like Atlanta and Oakland, California, where they had created these little spaces, you know, candles, floral arrangements, wine bottles to their ancestors. And my identity or my search for identity took me to that, if you will, soft spot where many black Americans try to gather a sense of their identity through the effort of memory. And that's on multiple levels. Uh, I always tell my students on Dr. King's birthday, listen to a King speech. Read, read, read a King speech. On January 1st, 1863, the Emancipation Proclamation went into effect. Uh, on, the, on New Year's Eve, do something that, if you will, honors your forebears who may or may not have known that they were free. So your question is a very complicated one and my answer is a very convoluted one. Uh, my students who come from the African diaspora generally don't refer to themselves as African American. They're Ghanaians. They're Haitian. They're from the Dominican Republic. There was, when I joined the faculty a lot of years ago, there was one organization that represented the black students at Rutgers. Black Organization of Students. The acronym is pronounced BOSS. They are now one of a half dozen, suggesting that these immigrant, these first and second immigrant kids, really associate themselves from where they're from or where their parents are from. So this is something that I think black Americans will work out. Uh, a colleague of mine, Zain Abdullah, just published his first book. It's entitled Black Mecca, and it's about the black, the African Muslim population in Harlem. That Muslim population has had difficulty with the American-born black population, which sees them as competitors, which sees them as, um, well, competitors. What are they competing with or for? Jobs, residential spaces, political power. So it may be, and I think this is true, I should have gone into it, I think we are living through a period of time when the monumentalized African-American is being challenged by demography. We had a conference a few years ago at Rutgers and uh, one, of the one of the scholars said that the Million Man and the Million Woman March, 
those two marches suggested that uh, the monumentalized black is a thing of the past. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so I feel we've been privileged today to hear what um, Clement has called an ode, and I think that as I, the feelings that come to me suggest that it couldn't be a more perfect title because we have had something of a you know, history uh, today and a sermon and all things that make me see both the best and the worst of this country and uh, I'm more confused than ever about <laughs> what America is all about but I feel very happy in my confusion. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Reminders, uh, you know this is the first of the uh, five world affairs briefings. The next one is actually going to be held on International Women's Day, and we'll be talking about gender issues with a Scrantonian, Marianne McNish. And we go on to a uh, very interesting um, social media session with uh, Judge Vanaski, and then two on the Middle East, which uh, we all need, we all need quite, quite a bit of uh, insight, new insights into that part of the world. Also put on your calendar for next uh, season, next semester, uh, University for a Day is going to be on September 17th, which happens to be Constitution Day. And we have uh, one of America's preeminent constitutional scholars uh, with us, a PLMR from the Yale Law School, so be sure to be here. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Thank you.